think this would be a good time to get started. So I want to welcome everybody to the uh, Emeriti Lecture. Uh, my name is Barry Bowman, and I'm a professor emeritus from the Molecular Biology Department, and I'm the president of the UCSC Emeriti Association. Uh, we have these lectures twice a year. We have them in the, in the fall and in the spring. Uh, our, our purpose is a, a couple of reasons why we do this. One is really community education. We, we want the campus community and the larger Santa Cruz community to have a, a good sense of what's going on in the university and a sense of some of the really exciting results that are coming out of research at the university. And secondly, frankly, it's, it's to showcase the, the wonderful work that the Meritai faculty do, work that they continue to do years after their retirement. Um, usually we would be in the, in the music hall in person, uh, but there are some positive aspects to doing this on Zoom. Uh, we've had uh, more than 500 people register for this this lecture is probably going to be a, our all-time record for participation in the Emeriti Lecture. It allows many people to come in and see it. Now, you will be able to ask questions down at the bottom of your screen. There's the Q&A button. And just click on there and type in your question. And Joel will take some breaks during his talk and at the end, and we'll try to go through as many of the questions as we can. So let me... Uh, uh, to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, we have someone who knows this academic field very well. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that Sandy Faber is one of the world's eminent astronomers. She's made many major contributions to our understanding of the universe. And, and I would also add that, that Sandy has always been a, a good citizen of UCSE. So with that, Sandy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, and you are muted, good. You can hear me, right? Yes. Good. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and for helping to put on this splendid event. So it's up to me to summarize a lifetime of brilliant work by Joel Premack. Joel got his bachelor's from Princeton where he was the valedictorian, by the way, and later did a PhD in particle physics at Stanford. And as a particle physicist, he helped to create what is now called the standard model in particle physics and made important contributions to that. But he switched to cosmology and astrophysics in the early 1980s when began, people began to speculate that there was something in the universe called dark matter and that its total mass might strongly dominate over the ordinary stuff that Earth and human beings are made of. And there were thoughts in the physics community that maybe dark matter might be some as yet undiscovered um, fundamental particle. And this piqued Joel's interest. This was right up his alley and he began thinking about that. And this led to several really great works in which Joel, led the formulation of the cold dark matter theory of galaxy formation. And this was first set forth in full in a paper that was led by Joel. George Blumenthal and I were co-authors, but really the heart and soul of this paper was Joel. And the picture that he put forward there, he'll probably be telling us a lot about it tonight, remains the reigning paradigm in astronomy for the formation of galaxies. But Joel moved on from there to many other important discoveries. Basically, he's been involved in trying to unravel the structure of galaxies as two component entities, large dark, header, dark matter halos with visible galaxies forming stars within them. How does this work? How do they form? And as part of this, he and a graduate student uh, elucidated for the first time, really, the nature of very distant and therefore very early galaxies, which Hubble was studying by using the look back effect. And in more recent years, he and his team have produced some of the most advanced computer simulations 
of dark matter halos and the forming visible galaxies within them. So this is a, a, a spectacular oeuvre for an entire career. But Joel is not just <clears throat> a nerdy scientist. He has been consistently very interested in broader issues. For example, back in the 1970s, this was the era in which scientists were becoming involved with ethical issues in the shadow of World War II, the atomic age and so on. And Joel, even then as a very young person, was a co-founder of the Union of Concerned Scientists, a co-founder of the American Physical Society's Congressional Fellows Program. And with colleagues, he took actions which resulted in the prohibition of the use of nuclear reactors on space satellites, on American satellites. For uh, gee, Joel, I forget exactly how many years, 25 or so, he has, with Abishai Dekel, organized an annual summer conference called the Santa Cruz Galaxy Workshop, which draws in visitors, students, postdocs, and faculty from around the world. A very major service to the astronomical community. Very recently, he was the president of Sigma Xi, the honorary science faculty. Um, uh, uh, fraternity. And um, with his spouse, Nancy Abrams, he created a class called Cosmology and Culture at UCSC, where really the first of its kind, the two of them explored the importance of cosmic knowledge to the human race. And that grew into a total of four major books altogether, speaking tours, They've been around the world speaking to audiences and inspiring them, not only with the grandeur of the universe, but why this is vital knowledge for us today. So uh, let me close with some mentions of Joel's many honors and awards. He's a fellow of the American Phil F Physical Society, the AAAS, and also the California Academy of Sciences. He was a Sloan Fellow, a Humboldt Fellow, he won the Leo Zillard Prize from the American Physical Society for his work promoting the use of physics for the greater good, and most recently, the Lillian Field Prize for seminal contributions to our understanding of the formation of structure in the universe. Let me close just with a few words about a personal tribute to Joel. I feel that Joel has been the most important teacher in my life. Um, he is famous in the field for having a literally encyclopedic knowledge of our cosmology. He's read every paper and mm -hmm. amazingly, he remembers them all. <clears throat> so if you have questions, Joel is the first person you want to go ask. And beyond that, he's a brilliant teacher. He understands the physics. It's not just facts. It's why things happen, why things are important and He's been a wonderful teacher and collaborator to me over the years, and um, I just owe him so much in terms of my own research. So thank you, Joel, for many decades of a happy collaboration, and we're going to really enjoy your talk tonight. Take it away. Well, thanks very much, Sandy, uh, for that wonderful, uh, perhaps overly generous introduction. Uh, thanks also for mentioning uh, that I've done uh, a lot of uh, public talking and writing with my wife, Nancy Abrams. And a number of the images I'm going to be showing tonight uh, are really Nancy's uh, or our joint work. So I'm going to be talking about uh, three things. Oops, oh, there we go. Cosmos, galaxies, and planets. And uh, after each section, uh, I'll be glad to entertain a few questions. So we'll start with cosmology. Cosmos, the, the, the story of the entire universe. This image that's been the background is called the ultra deep field. It was taken by the advanced camera for surveys on Hubble Space Telescope. It's very beautiful. You see actually thousands of galaxies in this image. Every little dot in the background, except for the ones that have the spikes, which are uh, stars in our own Milky Way. But everything else in this image is a galaxy. Uh, many of them quite massive galaxies, but they're very small dots because they're very far away. 
However, everything that you see, all the light in the universe comes only from about half of 1% of what's actually out there. The other 99.5% of the universe is invisible. We can represent all of the matter and energy in the universe with this cosmic density pyramid. About 70% of the cosmic density, the matter and energy of the universe, is what we call dark energy. About 25% is cold, dark matter. The remaining 5% is atomic matter, almost all hydrogen and helium. About half of 1% is the hydrogen and helium that we can see in stars and glowing gas clouds. And all the other visible atoms make up about a hundredth of 1%. The stuff that we're made of, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, iron, etc. Let's zoom in on that part that we can see. As you see, we're using the Great Seal of the United States uh, to represent this because it turns out that uh, the volume of the bottom pyramid is about 99.5% of the total volume. So that can represent the hydrogen and helium. And basically all that comes out of the Big Bang is hydrogen and helium and of course, dark matter. So the first stars are just made of the hydrogen and helium There's hardly anything else. And all the other visible atoms come out from stellar processes, including supernova. And uh, that's where the periodic table comes from. Many stars in the very early universe may have been much more massive than our sun in binary star systems with other massive stars. When these stars ended their lives as supernovas, they became massive black holes. The Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, has now detected more than 50 mergers of massive black holes. We're now detecting them at a rate of more than one per week when the uh, system is turned on. These Observations confirmed predictions of Einstein's general relativity that had never been tested before. And we're now testing general relativity right up to the limit where things are, these black holes are going around each other at very close to the speed of light just before they merge. Uh, so we've never been able to test uh, that general relativity works so well at that scale and it's passed every test. In August, 2017, LIGO and another similar detector in Europe called Virgo announced the discovery of gravity waves from merging neutron stars. So not black holes, but stars, uh, objects that uh, form at the end of the life of somewhat less massive stars. Uh, they're about as big as San Francisco, but they have the mass of several times the mass of the sun. Data from telescopes shows that such events probably generate most of the heavy elements like europium, gold, thorium, and uranium. You can hear the gravity wave signals. You can sonify them. And this is what it sounds like. You hear that little chirp at the end? That's the, the signal that's detected from the merging of these neutron stars. The whole process takes uh, only a few seconds. So here's the periodic table of the elements color-coded to show the origin of the elements. Hydrogen and helium come pretty much from the Big Bang. Most of the helium in the universe was not formed in stars, although stars, of course, convert hydrogen to helium by fusion. That powers much of the light that comes out of stars. But most of the helium was actually made in the first few minutes of the Big Bang. Notice all of the orange. Those are made in merging neutron stars. We'll come back to that later. So here's another way of picturing the pyramid. The bottom, 
the 70% dark energy can be thought of as an ocean on which sail billions of ghostly ships made of dark matter. But we don't see the ocean and we don't see the ships. We only see the visible light from these galaxies, which we can think of as the lights at the tops of the tallest masts of the biggest ships. That's the visible half of 1%. And all the other atoms add up to about a hundredth of a percent. So this is our modern picture of the matter and energy content of the universe. Dark matter ships on a dark energy ocean. Because it's mostly dark matter and dark energy, we can think of it as the double dark theory. The technical uh, term is lambda CDM. Einstein used lambda to represent uh, what we call the cosmological constant, the simplest kind of dark energy. CDM stands for cold dark matter. And as Sandy said, uh, that's the current uh, standard paradigm for structure formation in the universe. That, that's the, the modern theory of the universe. Every so often I'm going to show a technical slide like this. Don't get worried, you don't have to understand the details. Uh, but for people who are interested, this is the secret of cold dark matter. So it's that uh, complicated picture in the upper left. What you're supposed to notice is that uh, as you move to the right, that's the scale factor, which is one over one plus the redshift. And that's a kind of a time parameter. So uh, the nearby universe is here. Uh, this is going back uh, already pretty close to the Big Bang, uh, about 90% of the way there. And then as you go back further and further, you're going back to the first few days, weeks, minutes. Uh, and the other thing that you're supposed to notice is the vertical axis, and that's how uh, much structure there is. Uh, the higher up you are, uh, the more it started to form. And what you're supposed to see is that this is 10 to the six solar masses, 10 to the nine solar masses, 10 to the 12. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has a total mass, including the dark matter, of about 10 to the 12 solar masses. Uh, so when you consider something that massive, that came into the visible universe. So this represents the visible universe, everything above the dashed line. And below the dashed line is material that had not yet become in the visible universe. Of course, the universe was, the visible universe was a lot smaller at earlier times. So first, smaller things came in, then bigger things and bigger things. But when these things came into the universe, the universe was mainly dominated, that is, it's mainly filled with radiation, photons and neutrinos, not matter, not dark matter, not ordinary matter. There was just a little of that. And the result is that there was very little growth in the amount of structure. You see how these curves all bend over. At roughly 30,000 years after the beginning, ordinary matter starts to become more important than radiation. And that's when things start growing as fast as they can. And those are these straight lines that you see in the picture. So what you see is that there's a piling up of structure on small scales, and then more and more separation on big scales. If you plot the amount of structure versus the mass of the structure, you get this curve that's sort of flat on the scale of galaxies like the Milky Way, 10 to the 12th and smaller, and then it starts to turn over and become steeper. So this is the so-called cold dark matter spectrum. Incidentally, uh, George Blumenthal, uh, our former UCSC chancellor and I worked this stuff out uh, in 1982 and our first publications were in 83. And uh, there was this famous paper that Sandy referred to uh, that uh, I largely wrote, but there's our names in alphabetical order. Martin Rees, of course, is uh, uh, the former uh, president of the Royal Society of England. He's now Lord Rees, and he's still uh, the Astronomer Royal of England. Uh, so does this theory work? Well, there's that same curve, flat and then falling more steeply. And now we can put all the data on it. And the agreement is spectacularly good. These 
uh, different images represent the ways we get the sort of data. So the matter distribution agrees with the double dark theory with lambda CDM. Uh, don't be uh, afraid of this complicated graph. The main thing that you're supposed to see, uh, what we're doing is we're describing the heat radiation of the Big Bang, which has been exquisitely measured by several satellites, most recently the European Space Agency Planck satellite, which looks like this. And each of these dots is a different measurement. These are measurements of the temperature distribution of the background radiation, the heat radiation of the Big Bang. This is mixing temperature and polarization. This is uh, the polarization angular power spectrum. Each curve is different. Each curve is predicted by the theory. The dots agree as well as they possibly could. The theory is fantastically successful. And I'm just showing you a little bit of the evidence we have for the theory. That's why people take this crazy theory that most of the universe is invisible so seriously. So cosmic background radiation agrees with the double dark theory. So you may say, we've got all that taken, under, uh, taken care of. We don't have to worry about that. Well, not so fast. There's a key parameter that describes how fast the universe is expanding. It's called the Hubble parameter or the Hubble constant represented by capital H with a little zero, a little zero means today. If you measure it in the big, the heat radiation of the Big Bang and other early measurements, early universe measurements, and extrapolate to the present, you get 67.4 with an uncertainty of only plus or minus 0.4. So it's basically 67. The units are uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec standard units, don't worry about the details. But if you do the measurements nearby, you get a different number. You get 73 plus or minus 0.8. The difference between 73 with an uncertainty less than one and 67 with hardly any uncertainty at all on its measurement is about six sigma. You don't get discrepancies like that by chance. Something is going on. It turns out that you can resolve this conundrum several possible ways, but the one that seems to do the best job, and I personally find the most interesting, is called early dark energy. So these curves represent, in the dashed curves, the standard double dark or lambda CDM theory, and in the solid curves of the same color, the early dark energy version. Notice that the amount of dark energy is essentially zero in the standard theory until recently, and then it zooms up and becomes more important than ordinary matter, or ordinary, the contribution of ordinary matter to the density. The total here is the cosmic density, and these curves are showing the contribution of dark energy in blue, matter in green, and radiation, neutrinos and photons in red. Notice that there's this little blip representing at most about 10%, but only for a period of a few thousand years, around 30,000 years after the Big Bang. And that turns out to be enough. There's this little episode of early dark energy to completely resolve the conundrum. And you get just as good a fit, in fact, if anything, a slightly better fit to the cosmic background radiation, but you don't have a discrepancy between the early universe and the nearby universe measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. Well, my colleagues and I decided that we would take this theory more seriously and work out its implications for structure. Uh, the earlier work was done analytically rather than with computer simulations. So we did big computer simulations. And what we discovered was that with this little bit of early dark energy, you get quite a change not in the universe today, but in the earlier history of the universe, things just form a lot earlier. For example, at redshift one, that's about 7,000 years ago, halfway back to the Big Bang, there'd be twice as many clusters of galaxies, sorry, 50% more clusters of galaxies than uh, with the standard theory. You may say, well, in that case, we surely would know. And the answer is no, we don't. There's actually a satellite which was just put up a year ago called Erosita, which is for the first time doing an all sky census of clusters of galaxies. 
And we will know within a year or two whether this theory is right or the standard theory is right. And there are many other tests. Uh, for example, with James Webb Space Telescope, the soon to be launched, we hope, successor to Hubble Space Telescope. Let me uh, show you now a little bit more about these dark matter simulations, the kind of thing I was just talking about that show the rate at which structure forms. So the guy on the stoop is obviously somewhat trying and saying quarks, neutrinos, mesons, all those damn particles you can't see. That's what drove me to drink. But now I can see them. And you too are gonna to be able to see dark matter. But I have to warn you, the visible stuff that you're seeing, the bright colors, represent invisible dark matter. So this is the evolution of a small region of the universe that's gonna turn into a galaxy, namely the dark matter halo of the galaxy, and the surrounding dark matter halos, little hosts, little galaxies. Notice that the center had been falling together, but now it's more or less formed. A few little things are still falling in, but it hasn't expanded anymore. So earlier it was expanding. So that represents today. Let's recap. Expanding, expanding, expanding. But at about 7 billion years, that's about halfway back to the beginning, uh, the dark matter halo at the center has stopped expanding. The halo in the upper left corner, uh, this guy, is still flying away. And the space in between is expanding very fast. But this isn't expanding. It's not falling together too much anymore. It's basically formed. So space has been divided into space that's tamed by gravity and wild space. These are terms that my wife, uh, Nancy, suggested. Wild space is the space that's being torn apart by the dark energy, which is basically a repulsion of space by space. So that's the important distinction in modern cosmology, not inner space, not, not outer space, which just means beyond the atmosphere, but tame space and wild space. This is a very high resolution simulation of the dark matter halo of a galaxy like the Milky Ways. Notice that the galaxy, 100,000 light years across, represents a tiny part of this much larger structure of dark matter. And these big blobs would be hosting smaller galaxies, satellite galaxies, or other nearby galaxies. The size of the dark matter halo of a galaxy like the Milky Way is about 10 times larger in each of the three dimensions. So in other words, a volume about 1,000 times greater. How does this fit into the large scale structure of the universe? More or less like this. So this is a slice of one of our big supercomputer simulations that we ran on NASA's biggest machine at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View. You see that the universe looks very filamentary. The little yellow dots are the dark matter halos that would host galaxies and small groups of galaxies. The big dots would host clusters of galaxies and they form where the filaments cross. These large dark regions are gonna have very few galaxies. We call those cosmic voids. Let's take a closer look at a thousand of the volume of this simulation, only a hundred million light years across. We're rotating it so you can get a sense of the three-dimensional structure. And what you see is that the dark matter halos lie along these filaments. And where the filaments cross, you get much bigger dark matter halos that would host clusters of galaxies or smaller, but still quite large groups of galaxies. We're zooming in now so you can get a better look. When we run these simulations, we show that we, we keep track of every single dark matter particle, many billions of dark matter particles. We find all of the dark matter halos. So what I'm gonna do now is show you the formation of that central object that the arrow is pointing at, just the central object. So every single dark matter halo that you're seeing is going to end up in that central object. The larger ones are gonna all host galaxies. 
thousands of galaxies, hundreds of fairly big galaxies. Notice that they're moving in, mostly coming down this way, across this way, and up from this side. They're moving in along those filaments. Notice also that most of these dark matter halos are not spherical, they're sort of oblate. I'm sorry, actually they're prolate is what I meant to say, they're prolate. That means they have one long axis and two smaller axes. More about that later. So when we run these big simulations, we don't just keep track of the halos, uh, of a single uh, halo formation, we keep track of everything. And then we can use that to study how the galaxies would fill all of these dark matter halos. Now, we can show you these simulations two different ways. We could show you how they grow in size, but if we did that, you'd hardly be able to see what was going on until they got to be large size, the size today. So instead, what we do is we blow them all up to the size they are today. In other words, we don't show the expansion of the universe. We take that part out of the imaging. It's called working in co-moving coordinates. And uh, it's one of the things that uh, cosmology students have to learn how to do when they think about the universe. So I'm gonna show you now one of these simulations in co-moving coordinates. You're not gonna see the expansion. You're gonna see how things evolve with the expansion taken out. So the universe starts very, very smooth. But very quickly, within the first billion years, all kinds of structure is forming. You can start to see these filaments developing. The filaments get thicker and thicker. The voids get emptier. The dense regions get denser. Gravity is the ultimate capitalist principle in the sense that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and there are never any exceptions. Incidentally, that, those terminologies, rich and poor, is the standard astronomical terminology. Uh, so how do these uh, linear structures form? The great Russian physicist and astrophysicist, Jacob Zeldovich, actually had it all worked out in the 80s. And uh, he showed that the mathematics is very similar to the mathematics that describes this image uh, of the bottom of a swimming pool where you got this caustic formation, it's called, where a lot of light comes together and makes these things very bright. And it turns out that there's a very similar uh, structure, that, a similar pattern that describes the way structure forms in the early universe and the way these filaments form. So uh, it's basically because collapse occurs first in one dimension, forming a, a pancake, as the Russians would call it, blini, then it forms in the opposite direction, and that makes these thin filaments, and then Third dimensional collapse makes the bound structures that galaxies form in. So these dark matter halos, that's what we call them, uh, but they're not uh, like the halos in a picture of a saint. They're actually uh, three dimensional blobs, uh, but they're mostly prolate. That is, they have one long axis and two short axes, and they tend to form along these dark matter filaments that you saw. And then as time goes on, the filaments get thicker and the halos get more spherical. So this shows more spherical, more prolate, that is more pickle shaped. And the shape evolution as time goes on, this is today, redshift zero is today, redshift one is seven billion years ago, redshift two is 10 billion years ago. Uh, so you see that structures grow in mass and become more spherical, but still not very spherical. The ratio of the short axis to the long axis here is a half. So the long axis is twice as long as the short axis. That's gonna turn out to be relevant for galaxies. So I've now described a little bit about the cosmos. Do people have any questions before I move on to galaxies? Barry, uh, any questions? So Joel, uh Early on, you described how recent experiments showing the collisions of massive black holes allowed us to confirm Einstein's relativity theory. Could, could you say just a bit about what in the data confirmed Einstein? 
So uh, it has to do with that chirp that you heard or that you saw if you look at the image, uh, the sharp up and down stuff. Uh, so that was actually predicted before any of these things were detected. In fact, uh, the way they were detected is by seeing if they fit that kind of pattern. And the pattern actually tells us the masses of the black holes, the spins of the black holes, how the spins are oriented together with the way the black holes come together. And uh, the pattern is actually quite complex and it agrees fantastically well with the observations. Uh, there don't seem to be any discrepancies at all. It all fits uh, really just as uh, the theory had predicted. There are many alternatives to standard general relativity uh, that are now completely ruled out by these observations. Okay, somebody's asked the really basic question, what is dark matter and dark energy made of? <laughs> well, I'm glad somebody asked that. I should have explained. We have no idea. <laughs> The most popular theory is one that uh, George Blumenthal and I helped to create uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, actually, I, I started it with Heinz Pagels, the late Heinz Pagels, uh, Elaine uh, Pagels, the famous historian of religion, uh, that was Heinz's wife. Uh, and Elaine is still thriving. Uh, and uh, that has to do with supersymmetry, uh, a very popular theory. Uh, that goes beyond what we currently know about uh, Almanchi particles. It's sort of uh, a popular, uh, larger theory. And we were the ones who first pointed out that uh, if supersymmetry is right, incidentally, string theory is based on supersymmetry. So if that whole picture is right, then you naturally get a dark matter particle that uh, uh, would have just the kinds of properties that are needed to make the structure that we see in the universe. And there's even some evidence for it, for example, from gamma rays from the center of our galaxy. But there are other possible explanations and, and uh, we really have components that any of these uh, theories of dark matter are right. Dark energy could just be Einstein's cosmological constant. There are easy ways to make other versions of dark energy. And uh, one of the most important uh, observational programs in astronomy today is trying to discover the nature of dark energy. So these are huge open questions, dark matter and dark energy. We know how they work, but we do not know what they are. And we don't know the details uh, exactly of how they work either. Okay, maybe we should move on then. Onward to galaxies. So Nancy Abrams and I uh, call this the cosmic spheres of time. As you look out in space, you look back in time because as you look further away, you're looking at light that left a long time ago to have time to get to us today. So as you look out to when the, this is the today, this is a, a galaxy like ours. When you look out to when the earth formed about four and a half billion years ago, the galaxies don't look much different from the ones nearby. Big galaxies formed about 10 billion years ago. And if you look beyond that, these are images from Hubble Space Telescope. The galaxies don't look anything like the nearby galaxies. They're clumpy and elongated and uh, really not much at all like uh, the nearby galaxies, which are disks and spheroids. Beyond that is the cosmic dark ages. New telescopes like James Webb Space Telescope will allow us to look a little further out, but not much because structure hadn't really formed yet. The colorful sphere is the cosmic background radiation, the different colors representing slightly different temperatures. And the outermost sphere is the Big Bang itself beyond which we cannot see. We know a lot about the nature of galaxies. Here are two of the most important things that we've learned. This is plotting the ratio of the mass of the stars in a galaxy to the dark matter halo, the total mass of the galaxy. And what you see is that galaxies like the Milky Way have the highest stellar content. How much is it? It's about 3%. But the dark matter is about 16% of the total mass. It's about one sixth, five times as much dark matter as ordinary matter. So what this is telling us is 
only about 3% turns into stars, even in the most favorable case of a big galaxy like the Milky Way. So most of the gas is still gas. It's not turned into stars. The other thing that uh, this one is showing is that if you plot the star formation rate, the number of stars that form per year in, in the mass of stars and units of the mass of the sun, uh, it grows proportionally pretty much to the mass of the galaxy. So this is called a main sequence because we found out that the properties of stars are largely described by knowing their mass. A star that has 10 times the mass of our sun has about 10,000 times as much light output as the sun. So mass is a really important parameter and it turns out the same is true for galaxies. Almost all the stars today are in large galaxies like our Milky Way. Nearby large galaxies are either disk galaxies like the Milky Way or big balls of stars called elliptical galaxies. But most galaxies in the early universe, as we saw, don't look like the Milky Way or like these elliptical galaxies. They're pickle shaped and clumpy. We're just now starting to figure out how galaxies form and evolve with the help of big ground-based telescopes like our Keck Observatory and the new telescopes that we hope to build like the 30 meter telescope and Hubble and other space telescopes that let us see radiation that doesn't penetrate the atmosphere. This is an astronaut installing Wide Field Camera 3 on the last visit to Hubble Space Telescope in 2009. The infrared capabilities of the new camera, which is one of the workhorses on Hubble Space Telescope ever since, has allowed us to see the full stellar population of forming galaxies out to redshift of about two and a half. This is uh, images of exactly the same galaxies. This is with the advanced camera for surveys, which took that beautiful picture I showed you at the very beginning of the talk, the ultra deep field. And this is the same galaxies, but now where we can see all the stars. In the lower image, you're just seeing the new stars that are putting out a lot of ultraviolet light, which Hubble Space Telescope sees as, uh, with the advanced camera for surveys, as ordinary visible light because of the expansion of the universe, the redshift of the light expanding the wavelength. By being able to see infrared, we now can see the full population and you see it looks very different. Here you're just seeing blobs where galaxies are forming stars. Here you're seeing the old stars as well as the young stars. So that's been very important for helping us understand what galaxies, how they evolve and what they really look like. Hubble allows us to see back not just the nearby galaxies, the cosmic afternoon, but back when galaxies are just forming 7,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, cosmic high noon, and even a glimpse of cosmic dawn, we're gonna get a much better glimpse with James Webb Space Telescope. Now, I and most astronomers were pretty sure that galaxies start as disks. And the reason goes back to this famous French physicist Laplace. Newton's laws explain why planetary orbits are elliptical, but not why the planetary orbits in the solar system are nearly circular, all in the same plane and in the same direction. The planets, uh, planets all go around in the same direction that the sun rotates. Laplace explained this as a consequence of angular momentum conservation as the sun and planets formed in a cooling and contracting protoplanetary gas cloud that formed a disk like this one. This is actually an image from a radio array of telescopes called ALMA in the Atacama Plateau in Chile. We have actually many of these beautiful images from the ALMA telescope. So these are all forming planetary systems and they're more or less what Laplace had in mind. For similar reasons, many astronomers once thought that galaxies would start as disks. But Hubble Space Telescope images of forming galaxies instead show that most forming galaxies are prolate, that is pickle shaped with one long axis and two short axes. This is a consequence of most galaxies forming in prolate dark matter halos oriented along massive dark matter filaments. So this is from our recent paper on this. And uh, what you're supposed to see is that uh, the lower mass galaxies, so the Milky Way is uh, about 10 to the 10.5 solar masses. Uh, so it's uh, a disk galaxy, that's these red ones, uh, with a spheroidal center. Uh, but the lower mass galaxies at redshifts 
out in the early universe and more and more as you go further back in the universe to the very early universe, this is redshift one, seven billion years ago, redshift two, 10 billion years ago. Uh, the blue is the prolate galaxy. So these low mass galaxies are mostly prolate. And of course, there's many more of these small galaxies than the big galaxies. And they look like these images. This is observed, this is simulated. So how do we tell? Because of course, all you see is the projection of the galaxy image on the sky, a two dimensional uh, image. And the answer is you have to look at statistics. Spheroidal galaxies always have a large ratio from the short axis to the long axis. Disk galaxies have an even distribution of axis ratios. If you see them face on, then they're round. If you see them edge on, turned on their side, they get thinner and thinner. And you have to see as many big ones as many edge on ones if they're disk galaxies because we're gonna see them oriented randomly. But prolate pickle-shaped galaxies have a very different pattern. They're only going to look round when you see them end on, and then they're typically going to be pretty small. So if you see that pattern, when they're long, they have a low axis ratio, short to long axis, and they only have a large axis ratio when they're small. That's the indication that we're looking at prolate galaxies. So here's a collection of galaxies. Every single dot is a galaxy, thousands of galaxies. This is what Hubble Space Telescope with the advanced camera for surveys at plus uh, wide field camera three lets us see. And what you're supposed to notice is that this upper corner that represents axis ratio near one, the face on galaxies is pretty much empty. Fairly large number down here not so many really big ones, but plenty of this size, but very few up here. Whereas if you look at the nearby universe, so mass increases to the right, redshift increases downward, which means we're going closer to the present as we go to the upper corner, and galaxies grow in mass as time goes on. So galaxy evolution would look this way. Sandy Faber particularly likes this way of presenting. So, uh, here you see lots of galaxies up here and down here. And incidentally, the red means that you're seeing them reddened. And that's because when you look at galaxies edge on, you're looking through a lot of dust. That's why if you look at the Milky Way at night, it's quite, uh, uh, it's got these gaps in it. That's because of the dust. So this is a picture that very much confirms that the dark matter halos, that the, that the galaxies rather are, are prolate. And to understand why we simulate them, so this is an image of the dark matter uh, shape, and this is the shape of the galaxy, uh, the stars. And you can see that it's tracking the shape of the dark matter halo very well. When we run these simulations, we can store thousands of time steps. And so we can make videos. This is the dark matter, this is the stars. Well, you can see that the stars are forming along the long axis of the dark matter. Time is moving on, so I'm not gonna be able to play the whole video, but uh, you can see that what's happening is that you're getting a pickle-shaped galaxy. And uh, this is from our paper uh, published uh, just after our paper that showed that this is what the galaxies actually look like. And this explained why they look like that. It turned out that our simulations had already been done and we're making these galaxies prolate. And I was so dumb, I didn't think to visualize the simulations until we realized that that's what the galaxies actually look like. Then we looked at the simulation and lo and behold, the simulations had done it right. We just hadn't appreciated that they were telling us that these galaxies started as pickle shape. Uh, this is uh, another pattern that uh, the Candell survey co-led by Sandy Faber taking advantage of the uh, wide field camera three that let us have the full stellar population viewed. So here what we're plotting is compactness. These are galaxies that are very small and dense. These are big and fluffy. And uh, the ones down here are forming stars rapidly and the ones up here are hardly forming stars at all. And the pattern we saw was that fluffy galaxies turn into little compact galaxies 
And then the compact galaxies go out, they stop forming stars, and that makes them redder and redder because the blue light comes mostly from the young stars. So uh, now this doesn't mean that the stars are moving in. What it means is that a lot of gas is flowing into the center of the galaxy and forming a bright central starburst. And uh, it's so bright that that's pretty much what you see. If you look carefully, you'll see that these images have an extended envelope of stars. So we call these blue nuggets. And these are quench nuggets or red nuggets. So the pattern is many galaxies become very compact and then they go out, they quench, they stop forming stars. But many other galaxies, probably the Milky Way is more like that, just slowly get more compact, they get big bright centers, but they stop forming stars or don't form stars as rapidly. It turns out that these fast track galaxies, the ones that become the big bright centers, are also the ones that tend to host supermassive black holes in their centers. And the color code here, this very dense, very dark thing, is saying that 60% or more of the galaxies in this part of the diagram, the fast track galaxies, uh, while they're still forming stars or as they're starting to go out, uh, host these supermassive black holes. The Milky Way has a massive black hole, uh, a few million solar masses in the center for which the Nobel Prize was given this year to Andre, uh, Andrea Goetz and uh, uh, also uh, Renner Gensel. Uh, and that's for beautiful observations of stars going around the black hole in the center of our galaxy that proves that it's really a black hole. But it's not a very big black hole in the center of our galaxy. These are really massive black holes that, that uh, are being detected here in the blue nuggets. Well, let me skip through this. This is to basically show that our simulations make slow track galaxies, they make fast track galaxies. So we see the whole pattern. Gas flows in rapidly, turns into stars that uses up the gas and drives the gas out of the center. Meanwhile, stars continue to form in the outer part of the galaxy. So we keep track of, again, thousands of snapshots from our simulations. We show the gas and the stars face on and edge on. Galaxy formation is a complex process. So if we, remember I told you about the main sequence of galaxies, that uh, galaxies grow in mass, but the rate at which they form stars is more or less proportional to their mass. And if we plot the sort of standard pattern, an individual galaxy will oscillate above and below and above and below, but maybe on a time scale of a few billion years, or maybe on a shorter time scale. That's one of the things we're still trying to understand. So some gas flows in and gets used up and the galaxy, uh, forms fewer stars, and then some more gas flows into the center. We call that wet compaction. And then you get a high gas density and lots of stars form, but then that drives the gas out. And you get a low gas density and not many stars form, and then some more gas comes in. And then the galaxy quenches. It stops forming stars pretty much and becomes a red galaxy. So that's the kind of pattern we see in our simulations. It seems to agree with the observations, but how do we make the comparison? We run many simulations. We see thousands, uh, actually 100,000 images of galaxies from telescopes like Hubble Space Telescope. How do you compare them? And uh, we developed computer learning, uh, machine learning approaches to do that. Uh, it's called deep learning. And uh, this is a paper that our collaborator, Mark Weirdos Company, who's visited Santa Cruz uh, for four summers, will be back this summer, except for COVID. Uh, we're hoping to continue. Uh, Abishai Dekel has visited uh, uh, for more than 35 years every summer, except for the last one. So uh, we use our simulations to train a deep learning code to recognize these three stages of galaxy evolution, the early prolate stage, the nugget stage, and then the post-nugget stage, which are typically disk galaxies, more or less like the Milky Way. 
And the trained deep learning code was able to identify these different stages. And then we applied the same code to all the Hubble Space Telescope images. And what we found was that the galaxies, the real galaxies were making these transitions at just about the same masses as our simulated galaxies. So here's some images. This is what the galaxies would look like if we could see them close up. Beautiful spiral galaxy here. This is what uh, we predict Hubble would see. And these are real Hubble images. And uh, what we didn't show you is the background, the stray light from very, very distant galaxies that make this sort of modeled background. But uh, you see that the patterns are really pretty similar. The prolate stage, the uh, nugget stage, these bright central things, often if you look so carefully, you can see that there's some remnant of that prolate stage. And then these disky galaxies. So here's an example, whoops, well, let me skip that one. Uh, so these are uh, the uh, compaction stage, the nugget stage. This is the pre-nugget stage. This is the post-nugget stage. And uh, what we see is the transition is occurring at around 10 to the 10, that's uh, 10 billion solar masses. Uh, so a galaxy somewhat less massive than the Milky Way. Milky Way is more like about here. And uh, this is a lower redshift, but still going out pretty far to 10 billion years ago. This is going out to another couple billion years. And again, uh, you see that we're seeing the transition, the nugget stage turning into the post-nugget stage. Uh, it looks like maybe it's occurring a little bit higher mass in this earlier universe, but still pretty consistent. Uh, with James Webb Space Telescope, instead of images like this, this is merging galaxies, we're going to get much more detailed images that look like this. And uh, if we have two of these compaction events, it's very confusing. And uh, the green is compaction, the red is post compaction, the green is compaction. Here are the two compaction events, two cases where gas flowed into the center, drove out, more gas flows in, makes lots of stars. Uh, and our, our deep learning code does a pretty good job, but with James Webb images, it's gonna do so much better. Look how tight that is. So we just can't wait to get our hands on data from James Webb Space Telescope. It would have uh, been much closer to being launched uh, early next spring except COVID is slowing things down. We're still hoping it'll go up uh, later next year. Okay, well, that's as much as I was gonna say about galaxies. Don't worry, the planets part isn't so long. Are there any questions about galaxies? Let me give you just a couple of quick ones. One, Joel, one, people ask about the color. Uh, do you just get black and white and fake the color or are the colors in the pictures real? Uh, well, they're fake in the sense that uh, our eyes don't see infrared light or ultraviolet light or x-rays or things like that. Uh, and so if we want to make it possible to see uh, with our limited uh, range of wavelengths that our eyes can see, you know, the eyes can see less than uh, an octave. Uh, the ear can hear many octaves. The piano can make uh, many octaves. Uh, an octave is a factor of two in wavelength and the eye sees less than a factor of two. So uh, in order to show the wide range of wavelengths that we can detect, especially when we're out in space, uh, we have to uh, represent uh, shorter wavelengths and longer wavelengths with light. Uh, I don't think it's fair to call that faking it because of course we always explain uh, when we do this and people are interested uh, exactly how we're doing it. But uh, the answer is that uh, we look at images of galaxies through filters, which only transmit a narrow range of wavelengths. And uh, we have typically seven different filter bands that we use uh, for these images from Hubble Space Telescope using advanced camera for surveys and wide field camera three. And so that gives us a wide range of wavelengths 
And uh, yes, indeed, we use all that data. So each one you can think of as a black and white image, but uh, of course we get uh, typically up to seven different images and uh, we're gonna have other wavelengths that are available, uh, longer wavelengths with James Webb. Okay, I should say that we're getting lots of good questions. So if your question doesn't get answered, I, I apologize, but we are keeping a record of the questions too. So just one more for this segment. Uh, someone asked, when did the black holes form in the formation of a galaxy? Well, that's a great question. Uh, we know that uh, uh, massive stars, stars that weigh uh, 10 times the mass of the sun or more, have very short lifetimes. They're very bright. Uh, as I mentioned, about 10,000 times as bright as the sun, but they only live a few million years. The sun, of course, has been shining for about four and a half billion years and it's got billions to go. Uh, and then uh, they form black holes with masses of several times the mass of the sun. Uh, and the early ones uh, we now know because we're seeing them merge uh, can have masses of tens of times the mass of the sun, uh, 40 times the mass of the sun, for example. Uh, now, the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies, we've seen evidence that they form uh, back in the first few hundred million years of the universe. Uh, how that happens is a mystery. It's hard to understand how they could form such massive black holes so quickly. And uh, there seems to be some process that forms extremely massive black holes, not like the ones that form from stars, but the black holes that weigh maybe 100,000 times as much as the sun in one go, just a tremendously uh, gigantic collapse but exactly how that works is not known. We have a number of different theories, but we don't know yet which one it is. And one of the things that we're hoping to learn when we can get a clearer view of this with James Webb Space Telescope is more about how these things form. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, we're working on right now, uh, doing the theory. Okay, we should resume. Okay, uh, the last part isn't gonna be so long, uh, partly because I don't know that much about planets. Mm -hmm. I've only recently started working on planets. So, uh, the uh, single biggest source of information about planets is the Kepler satellite, the Kepler uh, search, which looked out about 3000 light years in a particular direction. Uh, it had a second episode where it, it did look in other directions, but most of the data came from the first few years. And uh, another method that was pioneered here at UC Santa Cruz used radial velocities. Uh, so what Kepler did is it looked for planets moving across the face of the star, causing the star, the, the light of the star to dim slightly. And uh, the other method uses the fact that the star and the planet go around their common center of mass. And so the star is going to actually move away and toward us and away and toward us as the planets go around it. And uh, that's a great way of learning more about the mass of the stars. And of course, the great thing is when we can use both methods. But the one that's given us by far the most data is Kepler. Uh, Kepler was led by Natalie Battaglia, who got her PhD here at Santa Cruz and has now joined the faculty and is starting an astrobiology institute at UCSC. Now we used to think, before we started to get all this data on extrasolar planets, that our planetary system is normal, because of course we only had one example with rocky planets in nice circular orbits, all going around in the same plane in the same direction in the inner solar system, and then gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune further out, also in nice circular orbits. Well, it turns out that uh, that's really not what we typically see. It may be that in whole galaxies, there are certain ranges of distance from the center that are favorable for life. Too close to the galaxy center, there are too frequent supernovae and other dramatic events like those involving the supermassive black hole at the center. And too far away from the center, there may not be enough metals. That's what astronomers call everything except hydrogen and helium. Uh, all the other elements we call metals. Sorry about that, that's confusing. Uh, and of course you need to have uh, silicon and magnesium and uh, uh, other things like that, oxygen, to form rocky planets. 
So we looked pretty much right near the sun, as I showed you in the previous picture, just a few thousand light years. Remember our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. And of the 4,000 or so planetary systems that astronomers have discovered, mostly with Kepler, there are very few like ours with all the planets widely spaced in nearly circular orbits. Most planetary systems are much smaller and the, one, the planets with large orbits like Earth or bigger are usually pretty elliptical, not perfectly circular. The most common type of planet seems to be two to six times Earth's mass, what's called a super Earth. No such planet exists in our solar system. Some planets are in the habitable zone around their stars in which water would be in liquid form. But most of these planets are probably not hospitable to advanced forms of life. For one thing, they might not have had an optimal abundance of the long lived radioactive elements, thorium and uranium to power a magnetic dynamo and plate tectonics. Too much thorium and uranium would result in a lava world with frequent flood volcanism, the sort of thing that caused the greatest mass extinction events here on earth. Our living earth may be a rare Goldilocks planet with just the right amount of thorium and uranium. We actually published a paper today <laughs> that uh, goes into this in some detail. Uh, this is a discovery that we made led by Francis Nimmo in uh, our earth and planetary sciences department. Uh, I from physics, uh, Sandy uh, from astronomy, along with Enrico Ramirez Ruiz and his postdoc, Mohammed Safarzadeh. So this shows uh, an Earth-like planet with a magnetic field and plate tectonics, uh, uh, a complex inner structure, a solid core, a liquid outer core, uh, a mantle that has uh, all of this activity going on, uh, powering uh, plate tectonics. If you just have two or three times as much thorium and uranium, which plenty of planets do uh, compared to Earth, or you have a somewhat larger planet than Earth, but with the same amount of uranium and thorium, you're gonna get a lava world. Look at all this volcanic activity. Uh, and if you just have a half as much or a third as much, uh, you might have a magnetic dynamo or maybe not, but you're not gonna play tectonics. It'll be a, a, a dead, geologically dead sort of planet. Uh, this is the, an illustration from the actual paper. And uh, so this is Earth's thorium and uranium, three times Earth thorium and uranium, a third of Earth thorium and uranium. And we see that range for sure. Uh, and uh, what you see is that if you have much more than Earth, you have a period of very widespread volcanism, which may it make it difficult to have evolution of complex life. Too many extinction events probably. And uh, if you have more, you also don't get a dynamo. And uh, if you have a lot less, the planet is probably not gonna have tectonics. How can you tell how much uranium and thorium there is in the planet? And the answer is, look for other elements that you can easily see in the spectrum of the star that those planets are around. Remember, uh, these orange ones are the ones that are made in merging neutron stars and maybe some other things. Uh, and europium turns out to be a particularly good one. Uh, it's something that we've been able to measure in uh, more than a thousand stars. And it can predict the abundance of thorium and uranium in the star's rocky planets. So that's a, a sort of to-do thing uh, that we listed at the end of our paper, which was just published today. There's evidence that there was a late great bombardment of the inner planets of the solar system about 750 million years after the solar system formed. Uh, we see evidence in the form of craters on uh, the moon and Mars, for example, that seem to date from that era. It seems likely that there was a gigantic rearrangement of the outer solar system that caused many comets to hit the inner planets during this uh, late bombardment. Primitive microbial life got started on Earth soon after the late great bombardment ended. So primitive life may be very common in the universe, at least on planets with liquid water. There are moons in the outer solar system with liquid water under their icy surfaces, including Jupiter's moon Europa, amusingly similar to Europium, and Saturn's moon Enceladus. And uh, these are geysers on Enceladus. And NASA's Cassini spacecraft before it self-destructed actually 
uh, ran right through these geysers and collected the water. But unfortunately, we never imagined that that might be organic stuff in those. So we didn't have the capability of detecting that. Future missions certainly will. It took Earth another 2 billion years for complex eukaryotic cells to develop on Earth, cells that have uh, separate sections within them, like a nucleus and mitochondria and things like that. And complex multicellular creatures only evolved about half a billion years ago on Earth, the famous Cambrian explosion. Intelligent life and science only arose once on Earth, and so it may be very rare in the universe. New space observatories may make it possible for us to detect the effects of life on distant planets, for example, by their atmospheric composition. We'll also keep searching for messages and the huge square kilometer array of radio telescopes being built in Australia and South Africa will help. So let me conclude. Without dark matter, we wouldn't exist. With only the ordinary matter, the universe would be a low density featureless soup. Dark matter started to form structures very early. Galaxies formed within these bound halos of dark matter. Stars formed within the galaxies. And stars made elements beyond hydrogen and helium, carbon, oxygen, etc. Rocky planets formed from these heavier elements. Life began involved and evolved on one such planet. So dark matter is our ancestor and our friend. Science is much stranger than fiction. <laughs> Before the discovery that most of the density of the universe is invisible, no one imagined this. What else remains to be discovered? Well, thanks for listening and uh, watching, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Well, that was mind boggling, Joel. <laughs> so, so let me, uh, let me start with uh, uh, a difficult, puzzling one here. A person has asked, if we can't see beyond the edge of the cosmic background radiation and Big Bang, what do we think the universe is expanding into? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the universe uh, is almost certainly much bigger than we can see. Uh, so it's not just that uh, uh, our visible universe is expanding, very likely uh, the universe beyond what we can see is much like the universe that we can see. There's actually uh, within the context of general relativity, a theorem uh, that the fact that the universe seems so regular uh, allows us to extrapolate to gigantic scales beyond the universe uh, with very few extra assumptions. So very likely uh, the universe on a scale much larger than we can actually see is much like the universe that we can see. But we can't see beyond the Big Bang because uh, light hasn't had time to reach us from these more distant things. Uh, however, the same picture, uh, it's called uh, the idea of cosmic inflation that sets up the Big Bang to evolve into a universe like the one that we see. Cosmic inflation also tells us that on truly gigantic scales, much, much larger than the cosmic horizon, the universe is probably extremely different. It may not even have the same number of dimensions. It may have laws that are completely different from the laws of our physics. And uh, these aren't just wild uh, extrapolations. They're actually what uh, uh, our best guess as to the bigger context of our current theory uh, makes us think about things like uh, string theory. So uh, the short answer is we don't know. And the larger answer is we're very likely to be surprised. Okay. Another question, when you talked about uh, galaxy formation, you talked about gas flowing in and out. And the question is, what is the gas? Where is it from? Why does it keep coming? <laughs> well, uh, as I explained, most of the gas that's within the dark matter halos of galaxies has never turned into stars. Uh, remember, only about 3% of the mass of the total mass of the Milky Way is stars, uh, whereas about 16 or 17% would have started out as gas. Uh, so much of that uh, is probably still in the dark matter halo of the Milky Way or around uh, the Milky Way's dark matter halo and that of other galaxies. And the gas is hydrogen and helium with just a little bit of the heavier elements that were made in stars. 
gas in the early universe can cool and flow in and we have evidence that there are these streams of gas that uh, form uh, a lot of the stars. And we even have evidence that uh, gas can flow in very, quite rapidly into the centers of galaxies. Uh, that happens when galaxies merge, but it also happens, for example, when gas flows in from opposite sides and the gas clouds collide and shock and lose their angular momentum and flow into the center. Uh, and that's how you get these uh, compaction events, as we call them, where we form these bright centers. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not some mysterious kind of gas. It's just hydrogen and helium with a little sprinkling of heavier elements, the things we call metals. Let, let me follow up with, with that. So from Earth, as we look out to our planets, the empty space between planets, between us and the sun, how empty is it? Or what is there gas in there? What, is there dark energy in there? What is in that space in our immediate environment? Great question. Uh, the answer is uh, there's quite a lot of gas. Uh, for one thing, uh, the sun uh, has what's called a solar wind. Uh, the uh, outer atmosphere of the sun is extremely hot. And occasionally there are even mass ejection events that produce uh, vast streams of gas flowing out of the sun, hydrogen, helium mostly. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, uh, the stuff in between the planets. The dark energy, if it's a cosmological constant, is just uh, uniform density. And it's much lower density than matter, both ordinary matter and dark matter, within galaxies. But in between galaxies, especially when the galaxies are separated and, and we're talking about voids, the dark energy is by far uh, the dominant form of energy and, and uh, uh, mass. And that's what's making the universe expand faster and faster. So uh, it's important to understand that galaxies are not expanding faster. In fact, they're not expanding. And indeed, uh, our local group of galaxies consists of uh, two giant galaxies, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy. And they're actually falling toward each other and will collide in a few billion years. And when that happens, probably vast numbers of new stars will form as gas flows into the center of the forming uh, Milcomeda or whatever you want to call the, uh, the galaxy that's going to result from the collision of these two giant galaxies. This is going to happen around the same time as the sun will turn into a red giant star and swallow up the inner planets. OK, another person asked, uh, is dark matter being uh, taken in by uh, black holes? <laughs> uh, no, uh, probably not. But again, we don't really know what the dark matter is. Mm -hmm. It's possible that dark matter uh, is a consequence of uh, some kind of particle aspect of the universe. And if it's the kind of particles that are not at the lowest energy state that's possible for that kind of particle, uh, and if, it's, if these particles are what are called scalar particles, they don't have spin, uh, then that ordinary that that situation makes a form of dark energy. Uh, however, if that's what's going on, very likely the dark energy period will end. Uh, that was the idea of this early dark energy picture, where uh, there's such a process that happens in the very early universe, but it only lasts for a little while. And cosmic inflation is a gigantic version of the same story, uh, where uh, one has, for example. Uh, an elementary particle that's not at, at the minimum energy that it could possibly have, and it's a scalar particle without spin. And that automatically leads to a, a very large, but very, very uh, short-lived form of dark energy. But as I say, we don't know what the dark energy is. And uh, so uh, its interaction with, uh, with anything else uh, remains to be discovered, including uh, with black holes. OK. so. Does our understanding of the universe uh, tell us whether there are indeed multiverses? Well, the multiverse picture, uh, at least one of several different meanings of this term multiverse, uh, is what I was talking about when I said that uh, in this picture of uh, cosmic inflation, that is sort of the standard idea that sets up the universe that then turns into our universe, that, that basically sets it up to have a big bang like ours. In most versions of cosmic inflation, 
on gigantic scales, the universe is very different. And it could have different bubbles that have different laws of physics and maybe even different numbers of dimensions. And that's the multiverse. That's at least one of several different uh, ideas that people use that term multiverse to describe. Okay, here's a question from one of your physics colleagues. So does the statement about the development of structure like we see depend on the assumption about the size of the initial perturbations? That is, if initially it was something larger, how would the story change? Well, uh, they're actually, uh, the way that we describe this is with uh, a, a description of all the different size scales. And uh, in the picture that I drew at the, where I showed you 10 to the six solar masses, 10 to the 10, 10 to the nine solar masses, 10 to the 12, those are just examples. Uh, so there's a power spectrum that describes all the different scales. And it turns out that uh, in order to make a universe like the one that we see, you need to have something that's very close to a scale invariant power spectrum. What that means is that the amount of structure that exists as each scale comes inside the universe, inside the cosmic horizon. So as time goes on, the cosmic horizon gets bigger and bigger. So it encompasses more and more stuff. And so as time goes on, larger scales can come inside the horizon. And what's needed is to have the, to produce the universe that we see is to have the amount of structure, the, the fluctuation amplitude uh, should be almost independent of the time. Then, depending on whether the universe is dominated by radiation or by matter or by dark energy, uh, you get different growth of the fluctuations. And that's what properly, that's what describes uh, the uh, cosmic background radiation the formation of structure on all these different scales. That's the secret of the cold dark matter picture that it naturally explains that. Uh, and cosmic inflation naturally sets up these fluctuations to be scale invariant. And the fluctuations just come from uh, the, uh, uh, right, I'm uh, stopping uh, screen sharing so you can actually see me answer the question. Uh, so, uh, Quantum fluctuations naturally produce the scale invariant fluctuations. So quantum fluctuations in this early inflationary era uh, naturally produce uh, something very similar to the scale invariant structure, but it's not exactly scale invariant. Uh, it tends to have uh, a little bit less structure on small scale, a little bit more structure on big scales than pure scale invariant. And that turns out to be consistent with observations. And so uh, very detailed observations of the cosmic background radiation that are in the process of being prepared now will give us more information and may point to the precise uh, structure, the precise uh, physics that formed these structures. But, but the short answer is that we're making predictions about all different size scales, not just uh, a particular size scale. And that's what you need to explain the observations of the cosmic background radiation on different scales, and also all the different size structures that we see, uh, cosmic voids and super uh, scale structures uh, and clusters and galaxies and the smallest galaxies and so on. Okay, maybe we'll finish with a philosophical question here. This is a good one. So it seems that everything is essential for, oh, it seems that everything that is essential for our existence is created from the beginning of the universe at different stages. Maybe the universe was created to bring it to the stage of human existence. Is it being selfish to think that humans are the end result of creation of the universe? Well, I don't know about it being selfish. Uh, it's uh, a fact that we are uh, here and we probably wouldn't be here uh, and who knows, maybe intelligent life wouldn't be in the universe if it didn't have properties pretty similar to what we see. Uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe we were just lucky. Maybe there are loads of other multiverses and uh, many of them are sterile. Uh, and uh, so it could be that uh, the reason that uh, our universe turned out to be so uh, uh, hospitable that we could exist is that uh, uh, we're here and it had to have been that way for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't know. Uh, uh, it's also possible that there are really only one 
there's only one kind of laws of physics and only one kind of universe that could form. We have no idea whether that would be the case, but maybe that's in fact the case. And uh, then uh, the, hospitable, the hospitality uh, for life like ours uh, is built in. Uh, one of the things that I found really striking about this discovery that we made when you uh, vary the amount of uranium and thorium is that uh, there actually are, are uh, quite a few planets that will have the right amount. Uh, there'll be quite a few planets that don't, but uh, it's not a small fraction uh, that, that do. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, hospitable planets aren't so rare. Uh, uh, I, I don't know uh, how well, uh, let me just mention that uh, uh, one person who wrote a lot of things about this is Freeman Dyson. Mm -hmm. uh, Freeman was uh, one of the most interesting physicists of the 20th century uh, and into uh, the first decade of, uh, of this century. Uh, and uh, he wrote in an essay, maybe the universe knew we were coming. Uh, because it is so strikingly uh, possible for life like us to exist. But on the other hand, uh, uh, that's neither here nor there. I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I prefer to answer the, the kinds of questions that we can answer in physics and astrophysics with observation and theory. And uh, these are the kinds of questions uh, that may be beyond that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, questions like the earlier ones that we were asked, like what's the dark matter and what's the dark energy? I'm very much hoping that we're gonna be able to answer those questions. Well, Maybe thank you better. very much, Joel. That was, that was fabulous. That was mind blowing, quite literally. Uh, the one downside of the Zoom meeting is that we cannot now go out and eat cookies in the lobby. <laughs> you will have to find a cookie yourself, but it was, it was a wonderful talk. We, invite you all to come to our Emeriti lecture that will be held in April. It's tentatively going to be on the politics of, uh, of Africa. Uh, still not completely scheduled. We will probably still be on Zoom, but uh, not, not certain. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to Joel, great talk. And we appreciate the, the great turnout that we had for this lecture. Thank you all. <laughs>